Hi there and welcome. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, an independent online Catholic news source. You can find us online at www.cruxnow.com. That is cruxnow.com. Welcome to another of these occasional features on the Crux YouTube page where we try to bring to you a cross section of movers and shakers and interesting voices in the Catholic conversation. Normally, I find myself in the position in these interviews uh, of having to present a lengthy bio uh, of the person we're talking to because, quite honestly, uh, they are usually not quite superstars of the caliber that we have with us here today. Uh, I will nevertheless give you a thumbnail sketch. Uh, Dr. Scott Hahn, and of course, Unless you have been living under a rock in the Catholic Church for the last 20 years, you already know who Scott High is. But uh, in any event, he is the founder of the St. Paul Institute for Biblical Theology. He is a professor at the Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. Let me get this right. He holds the Father Michael Scanlon Chair of Biblical Theology in the New Evangelization uh, at Steubenville. He is the author of more best-selling and popular works on the Bible and Catholic faith and Catholic spirituality than most of us have ever read. Uh, they include Rome's Sweet Home, The Lamb's Supper, The Fourth Cup, Hail Holy Queen. Uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, Scott is also the husband of Kimberly for 40 years. Together, they have six children and 18 grandchildren. So when God said, be fruitful and multiply, you certainly cannot accuse Scott Hahn of not paying attention. Uh, Scott's most recent title is Hope to Die, the Christian Meaning of Death and the Resurrection of the Body. Dr. Scott Hahn, one of the great men of the Catholic Church, someone I have admired for a long time. Thank you for being with us here today. You're most welcome, John. It's great to be with you, even though it's a quite a distance. Well, yes, but this is the post-COVID-19 world, Scott, isn't it? Uh, in which the virtual sort of substitutes for the real uh, in some ways. Um, but, uh, but in any event, uh, I, I live for the day when we can get together face-to-face. -to -face, but for now, this will more than do. So let's talk about the new book, Hope to Die. Um, which fundamentally is about the, the Catholic Christian understanding of death, uh, and of course what follows then from death, re the resurrection of the body, the life to come, and so on. I'm interested in why you decided to do this book now, uh, because in a way, you know, this is a perennial theme, isn't it? Um, I mean, it's, it's certainly, I suppose, the, the coronavirus, uh, this, this major public health scare, uh, has, has, for many people, raised the question of death anew, but, but it's been around and will be around uh, as long as there is mortal life. So what is it about this moment that to you seemed especially propitious for this project? When I began working on this book two years ago, I had my reasons and I also had my own timing. I thought, it'd be good to write a book that deals with the Christian meaning of death and the resurrection of the body that would be timed to be released uh, Easter of 2020. But I had my own purposes and I had my own timing, but I think divine providence had higher reasons and better timing. I, for me, it was really the capstone of a Eucharistic trilogy that I began way back in 99 with the Lamb's Supper and then another work called Consuming the Word and most recently, the fourth cup, I wanted to kind of demonstrate that the Eucharist is the sacrament of the resurrection, that it is the real presence of Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity, and it is the same body that was in the upper room on Thursday and on the cross Friday and in the tomb on Saturday, but more precisely, the real presence of Christ is, as uh, Professor Durwell pointed out for many decades, it is the sacrament of the resurrected body of Christ. It is not just resuscitated. His innocence is not simply vindicated. His humanity is divinized, and it is divinizing us. The Spirit makes his sacred humanity communicable and edible for those of us who are called. And when we receive his body blood, he sets into motion the fulfillment of a pledge 
that he gave his followers one year earlier before the Paschal mystery. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, I will raise him up on the last day because this is no ordinary meal. When we have an ordinary meal of steak or fries or salad, we assimilate that to our body. But when we receive Holy Communion, Christ truly but mysteriously assimilates us to his glorified body to set in emotion the transformation of our mortal bodies, thus fulfilling the purpose of God in making the human body something that is dignified from the very beginning and helps us to rethink the way we live our lives in this body. So that was my purpose, but never in my wildest dreams could I imagine this uh, pandemic setting the stage for a much larger and more intense context for the book to come out. So, you know, glory to God. <laughs> you know, Scott, it, th this is uh, not directly related to your book, but it's a question I wanted to ask you. I, I thought about you often during the, the period of the coronavirus because you have written so profoundly and so passionately about the Eucharist over the years. I mean, I know you were a man of many hats and many interests, but one could argue that the Eucharist has almost been your e de fix uh, over the years. And I'm wondering the, the kind of enforced Eucharistic fast that so many of us experienced during the coronavirus lockdowns because of the suspension, of course, of public liturgies and the consequent inability to do anything other than a spiritual communion. How did you experience that? And, and, and as, you, as you look at it now, as we are beginning to exit that period, would it be your hope that people are going to come back to the public celebration of the Eucharist with a renewed appreciation for the mystery? You know, I, I'm sure that some will and some won't. I must admit that it was a very difficult trial for me and for my family. Uh, I look back on Palm Sunday weekend when our son Jeremiah was scheduled to be ordained to the transitional diaconate for the Steubenville Diocese, and that was delayed. And it seemed to be rather indefinite since there was no alternative date scheduled. Thanks be to God, he was just ordained last week as a transitional deacon, and our whole accepted family was able to travel up for the most part and join in the celebration. But I'm, I've been given permission by my daughter to quote her because several weeks ago, in the midst of this um, fast, as it were, uh, she said to me something on the phone that really struck a chord. She said, you know, I didn't realize until this time how much I'd been taking the holy sacrifice of the Mass for granted. And she's no nun. I mean, she, she has four <laughs> kids. She's got a very busy life. She doesn't exude spirituality. But she went on to say, I find myself with a holy hunger for holy communion like I have never known in my entire life. And I said, Hannah, I think you're echoing the, the sentiments, the deep feelings of many, many people, and not just blessing your father's heart. <laughs> but I, I, I do sense that, uh, you know, uh, you don't know what you've got till it's gone, as Joni yeah. Mitchell put it way back in the 70s. And now that it's back, I do believe that faith is going to be stoked and reignited. Well, anyone who can quote Biblical theology and Joni Mitchell in the same sentence. I, I just stand in awe, Scott. Um, you know, I often thought during this period, and of course, you know the line um, from Ratzinger's Behold the Pierced One, written before, of course, his election. When he talked about St. Augustine in the last years of his life denying himself the Eucharist, because when he met Jesus in the afterlife, he wanted to be hungry for that community. Um, and I, I, I hope that that's the spirit uh, which we, you know, with which all of us uh, who experience this fast return to the Eucharist. I know in, in my own case, I, I am much more conscious of the great gift uh, that we have simply because for a while I didn't have access to it. Um, and it probably had become routinized and, and then all of a sudden it was taken away and you know, as you say, uh, that does change one's perspective. All right, back to back to your book, uh, which once again is Hope to Die, The Christian Meaning of Death and the Resurrection of the Body. Um, you talk in the book about the, the, the classic Christian understanding of the human person as a synthesis of body and soul. Why is it so important for us to understand human existence in those terms, and how does that alter the way that a Christian thinks about death as opposed to anyone else? 
we're living in a culture of extremes, especially when it comes to the body, about which I think most people have a certain ambivalence. Uh, they love it too much, and then they turn on it and show contempt for it. And so we tend to indulge the flesh. And once we've gotten fat or sick or weak, where we face our mortality, we sort of resent the mortal condition in which we've lived. And so what we have to do as Christians is to communicate the fact that there is a great dignity to us as humans in possessing a human body. We're not disembodied spirits like angels, and we're not mere animals either. And so the body has always been an essential part of what it means to be a human person made in the image of God from the very beginning. Uh, and so this gift of human life that is natural is obviously supplemented by the sacred mystery of a divine life that is supernatural. In the span of 10 verses there in Genesis 2, this mystery is unfolded, where, where our first father is formed from the dust of the ground, and then 10 verses later in Genesis 2.17, he's invited to partake of the fruit of all of the trees, but the forbidden fruit. The day you eat of that, you will surely die. Well, you turn the chapter, and when they eat, they don't drop dead. And so was it an idle threat, or was there a mystery of a life that goes beyond the great dignity of human life in the body? And I think that's the key, that what our first parents did, in a sense, was to commit spiritual suicide by snuffing out the life of God in their soul. You know, as a Calvinist pastor, I used to believe that infants were born depraved. As a Catholic, I recognize that infants are born deprived of divine life, but with the great gift of human life. And so what I want to do in this book is to retrieve the sense that when Paul is done discussing the mystery of original sin in Romans 5, he goes on in chapter 6 to discuss baptism in terms of a resurrection. The restoration of divine life shows us that it's more than a metaphor, that a newly baptized infant or an adult convert who is baptized is resurrected more than Lazarus was after four days since he gets his natural physical body back, but we get that sacred mystery of a life that is divine and eternal. It's not less valuable, but more, but it's also more vulnerable. And so this mystery of divine life is united inseparably to our human bodies, to our human souls, creating a kind of composite that is baffling perhaps even to the angels. But in fact, it is our lot in life. And so we recognize that body and soul are united until death. And then when body and soul separate, this is unnatural. It isn't something that we're longing for. We long to go through death as a door, not where we lose our life, but we can make it a gift of love. And so the Eucharist is, for me, what brings this back together again. And, and that uh, was going to be my final question. Um, you know, we were talking a moment ago about the Eucharist, of course. The Second Vatican Council says that the Eucharist is the source and summit of Christian life. Tell us how a Eucharistic faith how faith in the Eucharist should also sort of leaven and shape the way we think about death. When we look at the Eucharist, we should be able to see through the eyes of faith, not only Christ's resurrected body, but our everlasting destiny. The fact that we're partaking of his body, blood, soul, and divinity, that the Holy Spirit has made that communicable, edible, but for a specific purpose, to set into motion the kind of eschatological destiny that is quite simply almost too good to be true. It goes beyond our highest hopes, but it's not plan B. This is exactly what was set in motion back in the beginning at creation when we were formed body and soul, when we were gifted with this sacred mystery of divine life. So what I want to do is to help people recognize that the Eucharist, the Paschal Mystery, the Death and Resurrection, the Blessed Trinity, the Eternal Hope are more than Catholic talking points, more than simply articles of the Creed. St. Ambrose, I draw from, you know, when you look at these articles in the Creed, you recognize, okay, they're permanent, they're solid, they're like stones, but when you blow off the dust, you recognize that they're precious gems. And as the son of a jeweler, I have great appreciation for the sacred mysteries being sort of like the pearl of great price, that when we can see in these sacred mysteries our future destiny, it's going to be a family reunion that will make the happiest vacation seem miserable in comparison. 
And if this seems like, well, that spicy hot rhetoric that comes from an overzealous convert, I beg to differ. I think when we get there, we'll look back and realize that my words fell on their face. They, they fall far short of the glory that is ours, that is not only our destiny, but our identity as beloved sons and daughters of God and brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, you know, the darkness is now, I think, deeper than anybody expected. And so it's time for us as Catholics to bless our culture and our loved ones by finding as many light switches as we can, because the good news is better than we thought it was. And I think the, the light of the gospel is going to shine more brightly in this darkness than perhaps ever before. Well, folks, that, that is a small taste of why Scott Hahn is such a popular writer, speaker, evangelist, point of reference for something in the Catholic Church. Uh, he is smart, he is articulate, he is passionate, and he is pithy. Uh, and it is rare to find all four of those qualities wrapped in the same package. Uh, his new book, once again, is Hope to Die, the Christian Name of Death and the Resurrection of the Body. It is published by Emmaus Road Publishing, which is a, an imprint of your St. Paul, uh, Paul Project uh, for Biblical Theology. Uh, you can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any place else where fine books are sold, and I encourage you to do that, to say. So, Scott, thank you so much uh, for being with us here today, uh, and I hope we can have you on uh, the Crux YouTube platform again sometime soon. I look forward to that. I would also look forward to dinner again at Roberto's if they have survived the COVID crisis. Roberto's has survived. Uh, Scott is referring to one of our favorite eateries. What we're actually going to do is that you have Kim, it, when you and Kimberly can next be in the Eternal City, uh, my wife and I will have you over to our place. I will make you my version of Bucatini Amitrachana and then something beyond that. But I promise you, you will coming away. You will come away thinking that this meal is kind of quasi sacramental. So it's not quite the same thing. But you will see God. That's what I'm promising. Um, so I look have, forward to that. We absolutely. I look forward to that, that God, more than more than you know. I look forward to sharing the physical side of being spiritual with a meal. Yeah, exactly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that is the great wisdom of Catholicism. Where the Catholic sun doth shine, there's laughter and good red wine. All right, uh, Scott and I could riff on forever. That's probably not wise. Um, do check out Scott's new book. Once again, uh, Hope to Die, The Christian Meaning of Death and the Resurrection of the Body. Also, keep checking out the Crux site where we bring you the best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. That is cruxnow.com, cruxnow.com. Do keep checking our YouTube platform as well, where we try to bring you these occasional features until we see one another again. Have a fantastic and blessed time. God bless.